In life, when someone has committed the worst possible atrocity, you give them the death penalty. In college sports, you do the same thing. And you may not believe me, but in the opinion of some, it's even more devastating. It's 1951, sights set in Lexington, Kentucky, and some old school hoops on the agenda. For somewhat of an idea on the basketball landscape at the time, the NBA was just formed a couple years ago and existed as a little known struggling pro league. UCLA basketball held zero national championship trophies, guys like Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain haven't even begun their college careers yet. So yeah, old school hoops. In college sports at the time, violations and literal active cheating is rampant across the board. Everyone is doing it. Football is the main villain, but it exists everywhere, completely unregulated. Though the NCAA has existed for a while by now, they have yet to give out any sort of punishment to a university. They don't even have a group dedicated to infractions. For about the first 50 years or so, their whole investigation system admittedly went off what they referred to as home rule, which was, in so many smart lawyer words, the honor system. They trusted schools would report themselves for violations. Schools said awesome, and everyone lived in naive harmony. That is, until the NCAA said, wait, people wouldn't be lying to us, right? Well, I guess they could. Then came the sanity code. A misnomer if there ever was one, this was an ultra strict set of rules implemented three years ago that aimed to protect amateurism. This was the NCAA's first push into the punishment zone, but the sanity code only contained one single punishment, and that was the complete expulsion of a university from the NCAA entirely after one single violation, barring a two-thirds vote. But again, the NCAA didn't have any sort of investigating department or committee or anyone to deal with this stuff. So how did they find who broke rules? Well, they sent a nice little survey out to every college listing all the violations they're looking for and asking with a cheeky little smile, did you do any of these? The school was to fill it out and send it on back. If you ever complain about the NCAA's overbearingness in modern times, just know, they are overcompensating for a hilariously unbelievable history of incompetence. So, knowing the new punishment, what do you think happened when the NCAA sent out those letters? Well, seven schools actually chose to be honest and admit to it, even though way, way more were definitely guilty. But to reward these seven for their honesty, all of them were immediately recommended for expulsion from the NCAA, including Maryland, a national football power at the time. Everyone else was blindly trusted completely. Then after that, the NCAA voted and did not even reach that needed two-thirds majority, meaning the schools would not be expelled, proving the whole ordeal useless, making everyone doubt the authority of the sanity code, and the whole thing being thrown out of the rulebook. Back to square one. There's still countless violations and cheating going on, it's a very open secret, so the NCAA finally makes an investigation committee and hires a head and a body to take care of the many issues. Their very first case? The University of Kentucky. When the black suits arrived on campus, the mood should have been carefree and confident. On paper, the Wildcats were thriving, fresh off an NCAA tournament championship which was their third in four years, establishing themselves as the country's team to beat. However, reading between the lines reveals the program's truth. Already embroiled in controversy, with much more that was still in the dark, to anyone in the know, punishment was not a possibility. It was impending. Just this year, three former Kentucky basketball players were arrested, not punished by the NCAA, actual handcuffs and jail cells, for their role in a complex illegal gambling operation that was paying college athletes to manipulate game scores. 
The scheme centered around the City College of New York, who won the NCAA tournament in between Kentucky's four and also won the NIT tournament that same year. They're the only school to ever do that, and it's a feat that, as of now, is impossible to recreate. You're not allowed to play in both in the same year. City College was a solid program, and beyond them, the scheme was vast in its effects. 32 total players from seven different colleges were arrested for taking money to influence scores of games, in many cases throwing them, and that's just the amount of people they were able to definitively prove. As one of those seven schools, Kentucky was uniquely hobbled. Directly after his players were arrested, Kentucky head coach Adolph Rupp was confident his boys were innocent and positively remarked, Gamblers couldn't touch my boys with a 10-foot pole. But they could. And they had. The arrests had been made just before this last year's 1951 NCAA tournament began, but they were about games that took place years ago, specifically in that NIT tournament game they lost to CCNY. This is right around the time March Madness was starting to take over in status and popularity, but they weren't far off at the point. So it does make sense with how dominant Kentucky was, this was a weird, seemingly random loss for them. Now, none of the arrestees were on the team anymore. In the time it took for prosecutors to build a case, they had all three become NBA players. Dale Barnstable was drafted by the Boston Celtics, though never saw the court in his pro career. After the scandal, he was permanently banned from the NBA and was fired from his job coaching high school basketball. But Alex Graza and Ralph Beard lost a little more. They both were members of the Indianapolis Olympians, with Graza being a star, putting up over 20 a game, and Beard throwing out a respectable 16-4. and four. Graza was actually named the 1950 Rookie of the Year by newspaper writers at the time, though it's not a recognized award in NBA history. Being stars and national champions out of Kentucky, both these guys signed really weird but amazing contracts that gave them stakes in the ownership of the Olympians team. And even more, that stake was set to grow to the point where the two combined would be majority co-owners of this NBA franchise. But then the police came knocking and they were forced to sell off their shares for just 10% of what they were worth. Both were also banned for life from the NBA, creating two huge what-ifs in basketball history. It was some rough stuff for the Kentucky gang. A couple more players from the school would be added to the arrest list later on, including star 7-footer Bill Spivy, who constantly pled his innocence in the scandal up until his death. After being the only one of the 32 arrestees to plead not guilty, he was charged for perjury because multiple of his teammates implicated him and evidence pointed to him throwing games, but the case was later dropped. Spivy, still a senior in college, was completely banned from the Kentucky team by the school and was also banned from the NBA for life. He actually sued the NBA for $800,000 in federal court over it, then ended up taking a $10,000 cash settlement after realizing even if he won, he was going to be too old to play in the league after all these legal shenanigans. It's a bad look for Kentucky, for the key components of championship teams to be arrested in disgrace, and the death penalty hadn't even been brought yet. It was after the scandal died down that the NCAA came in to investigate with that shiny new committee of theirs. Kentucky thought that their choice to ban Bill Spivy was going to earn them some leniency, but... Through the course of another season, the NCAA found 10 different players who had received impermissible financial aid. They also found that the whole coaching staff knowingly committed the infractions. In their first ever formal enforcement action, the NCAA wasn't playing any games, and neither was Kentucky basketball for a whole year. The entire 1953 season, canceled. Just like that. Gone. Uh, of course, that's the thing. Uh, that caught, I think, all of us here at the university by complete surprise. I know it did me. I, I didn't have the faintest idea. Now then, uh, I know people said and uh, people wrote that I should have known. If I had been close to the kids, I would have known this. 
All right, let's see. Why would I be suspicious of these kids? Uh, in the first place, they won. Of course, we know what happens here. Kentucky becomes a zombie, a powerful blue-blooded zombie coming back from the dead with an angry vengeance. They went undefeated the very next season and were number one in the poll, but willingly sat out of the NCAA tournament to protest an unrelated rule. Then they won a championship just five years later and still reign today as a top team in the nation. I don't need to explain to you how good Kentucky is at basketball, you know that. What's insane is just how far they clawed their way back from. Even the other six affected schools in the point shaving scandal were all permanently destroyed. You can see the ramifications still today on each of them. And Kentucky got the death penalty on top of this. None of them did. So compared to these six, yeah, Kentucky made off pretty easy. But compared to the other four recipients of the death penalty, the Wildcats are a living miracle to still be standing today. It's the only time we have ever seen a college program come back like this, reach even close to their previous potential. It's usually a destroyer of worlds, but Kentucky literally survived death. Now, the title of death penalty is a bit misleading. The worst possible punishment that the NCAA can pan down does not involve slaughtering 19-year-olds or even canceling a team permanently. They've never done that. Though, remember, one of those was an option in the sanity code, just not the cooler one. But no, the death penalty in college sports refers to only a one or two year ban on a university's sport. No games, no nothing for an entire season, sometimes two of them. While on paper, the comparison to losing your literal life sounds extreme, in practice, the ramifications of the death penalty on a program can often be described in no other way than just that. We've seen Kentuckys, deserved, rough, but arguably not rough enough. They didn't go as easy the next time. In 1921, Southwestern Louisiana Industrial Institute, or SLE, made a monumental change, dropping industrial from their name and going from SLE to SLE. This same year, they adopted their very first team nickname, choosing to go by the Bulldogs. They played under that Bulldog name up through 1960, when another rebrand occurred, Slee to USL. Not as fun to say, but the name stuck through it. It wasn't until three years after that, when one particularly special football team came along, that it was challenged. USL's 1963 football squad was weirdly and kind of randomly made up of almost strictly players from Louisiana. The team had 39 players, 35 of which were from the state, and 30 were from within just 100 miles of the college. This led their head coach to coin the team the Raging Cajuns, with Cajun being a term describing the folk of southwestern Louisiana. Now, this isn't a Disney movie, that football team went 4 and 5, they weren't very good. The name, however, stuck. In 1967, the team dropped the second G, solidifying the Ragin' Cajuns we know today. We've hit fast forward about 20 years from the Kentucky basketball scandal, but staying in the sport. Truly, I cannot stress how many recruiting violations, illegal payments, and downright scumbaggery there was going on in college. It was even being punished at this point a lot, just not reaching the needs of the death penalty since Kentucky. The NCAA was on their way to having decent control, but one school was going to test them with an absolute monstrosity of a program. The Raging Cajuns men's basketball team wasn't squeaky clean. In 1968, them and their football team each caught two-year postseason bans for breaking a couple recruiting rules and practicing out of season. But it was still a team on the rise. Southwestern Louisiana was elevated in the offseason of 1971 from the college to university level in the NCAA, basically the old school going up from Division II to Division I. They were hot off a Final Four appearance in the D2 tournament, and in their first D1 season, the Cajuns made the March dance, won a game, then repeated that feat in the next year too. 
And in that 73 season, they finished seventh in the country in the AP poll, a team that a year ago was unranked and two years ago was a whole level of competition below. A lot of this success was because of the solid team they had and maybe even the rules they'd bent to get that team, but it wouldn't have been nearly what it was if it wasn't for USL's superstar, Bo Lamar. After Pistol Pete, Lamar stepped into the shoes as college's next great scorer. By the 71 season, still in Division II, Lamar averaged 36 points a game. Then, in their first Division I season, Lamar averaged 36 points a game again, leading the entire country in any division and proving it didn't matter who he went up against. When the NCAA was tipped off to possible rules violations at USL, it had to make some sense to them, not just because basically anyone the NCAA investigated was probably guilty of something, but because of this quick rise through the ranks that looked like it might not be done yet. The NCAA would accuse and provingly find USL guilty of over 125 specific violations, literally all over the board. There were small cash payments to players here and there, letting someone borrow a coach's car to drive across town, maybe lending a credit card for a nice pair of shoes. But what really pissed off the NCAA was the academic fraud. A number of players were found to have grades altered or tests taken for them by different people. In the worst case singled out, an assistant basketball coach at USL personally changed a recruit's high school transcript, then forged the principal's signature to authorize it. They came down with the hammer, canceling two full seasons of USL basketball. Not just that, their previous two NCAA tournament appearances were fully scrubbed from the books, putting an abrupt end to a program on the rise. This is the only time the NCAA has ever induced a multi-season cancellation of a Division I program. And for an idea on the effect this had on Southwest Louisiana, well, their basketball team does still compete at the Division I level. However, in just those two years before they got busted, they won three NCAA tournament games, including a third place game, going 3-3 three and three overall, and remember, those were their first two tournament appearances. In the 48 years since they came back from the death penalty, the team has won just a single March Madness game, going 1-9 and nine overall. This is the impact of the death penalty. It doesn't just hit you hard, it hits you in a way that you remember for a very long time, even if you do play again. They simply never recovered. Bo Lamar graduated and got out of USL just before the bomb was dropped. Unlike the Kentucky case, Lamar didn't have legal prosecutors waiting for him. He was free out of college. This was a matter of violating NCAA rules only, not actual laws. Bo Lamar was drafted in the third round of the NBA draft, but in the ABA, he was the league's number one overall pick and chose to sign there, playing for the San Diego Conquistadors under a head coach named Mr. Chamberlain. Mr. Chamberlain's first name happened to be Wilt, and he knew some things about basketball. Bo would average over 20 a night for his first two seasons before bouncing around and making the jump in the NBA-ABA merger to the Los Angeles Lakers. He played one season of decent basketball for him, then retired at just 26 years old as one of the best college and ABA scorers ever. He's been mostly forgotten about today, just a superstar we moved on from. The NCAA actually recommended expelling the entire Southwestern Louisiana program altogether, just kicking out every sport right there and then, which again would have been the only time that ever happened but a compromise was reached on a four-year playoff ban school-wide. In 1999, the school would change their name once more, settling on the current University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Despite the turmoil that the nickname has endured, the Raging Cajuns phrase is still printed on basketball jerseys, slapped on football helmets, and used as the official mascot. It can be associated to their brightest years or darkest ones that came right after, which is a nice thought, and it's awesome that the team's still fighting, but basketball some 50 years later has just never been the same there. 
So you've seen two of the five, which have each had very different endings for the schools at hand. Our next case brings us to 1987. But actually, 1985 is the cardinal year. It was then that the NCAA passed Bylaw 19.5.2.3 into their rulebook. This section, officially recognized as the repeat violator rule, is what the media would refer to as the death penalty. In this current, stricter form, the NCAA has only applied the death penalty three times. Of the three affected programs, only one still even exists today. And regarding these first two occurrences, even though the term death penalty wasn't really used for them at the time, the phrase wasn't introduced to sports until this 1985 rule, its meaning has been molded into the loss of at least one entire season, and thus is usually applied to these guys as well. Now, seeing that the penalty was clearly devastating on southwestern Louisiana just wasn't enough for the NCAA. I have to imagine it really pissed them off that Kentucky was back to being the best team in the country right after they came back. This is supposed to be the biggest punishment they have, and Kentucky just took it on the chin. Uh-uh. That's why, at least in my opinion, they held nothing back and took out both seasons on USL. And it worked. It absolutely crippled them for the foreseeable future. But it didn't really work the way the NCAA wanted it to. See, the question we need to answer is why does the death penalty exist? Believe it or not, the NCAA does not daydream about permanently handicapping college programs. It's more of a necessary evil, and I'll give you the logic from their point of view, because it's really not crazy. When a school breaks some rules, the idea isn't let's punish them so they become weak and can no longer break rules. The main purpose of NCAA punishments is fear. Sure, they'll try to take away any competitive advantage that was gained unfairly, but the death penalty is also meant to scare everyone else away from cheating too. You see it dropped on a school and you don't want to see it happen to yourself, so you clean things up and stop cheating. This logic kind of worked in the opposite way in the Kentucky case, because cheating almost looked efficient from that point of view, so with USL they went even harsher. But still, even after permanently affecting this basketball team, people kept breaking rules and cheating. So, you may think, okay, let's stop this, it's not worth destroying a school's program just to send a message that no one even listens to. But all the NCAA thinks is we need to make it even worse. SMU football was, to put it bluntly, a repeat violator. I mean, I can see where they were coming from with the name. In the 11 years before 1987, the SMU football team was put on probation five times by the NCAA. These were the bad boys of college football. SMU did everything you have to do to get a death penalty, then did it all 10 times again, handed the NCAA a loaded shotgun, and dared them to pull the trigger. The NCAA gazed back and fired a nuclear bazooka. I'm not even going to try to talk my way around this one with fancy words and weird framing. I'll be honest, the SMU case is the best one here. It's an unfathomable story, and because of that, I want to save it to the end. So we'll put a pin in it and be back. I will tell you now though, after nailing SMU even harder, we learn once again, the death penalty is not the magic solution to cheating. It keeps happening. And due to being so incredibly rough on the program, the SMU punishment kinda scarred the NCAA and everyone involved. The death penalty has never been used on a Division I team ever since. They went too light on Kentucky, found a decent balance with USL that may have even been a little too harsh, and then completely overplayed their hand with SMU ruining a team to the point they have been too scared to use it on anyone else in D1 sports. Though a very different level of athletic competition, it has been used two more times at the Division 2 II and 3 levels. First, there was the Morehouse College fiasco, a smaller Atlanta school that somehow got involved in violations way bigger than anyone there realized. 
Morehouse was founded in 1867 as a school to educate freed slaves. Over the next 130 years, they would build themselves up an impressive alumni network and establish themselves as an academic power. Director Spike Lee, most famous for the 2K16 My Career storyline, graduated from Morehouse. Also, Edwin Moses, the most dominant men's hurdler ever. There's Samuel L. Jackson, the highest grossing actor ever. And Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, they're doing all right. You want an ESPN stat? Morehouse College is the only historically black, private, liberal arts college for men. But athletics have never really been a big focus at Morehouse. They peak at Division II in some sports. So around the turn of the century, what I can only describe as a perfect storm occurred in Georgia. Let's start with the soccer team. It doesn't exist. There's a club team, but that's it. The coach of that club team was also the chairman of the school's history department, a professor, Augustine Kona. Now, around this time, a switch flipped in old Augustine's head, and for some reason, he decided to risk everything he had to make this soccer team as good as it could possibly be. Now, the best it could possibly be, just realistically, given their resources and situation, was probably a mid-level Division II program. So Augustine chased that peak of mediocrity. In 1998, the school's athletic director was let go for unrelated reasons. An intern was brought in for a short time before an actual replacement was hired, and this kind of slowed down the whole sports department for a bit. He worked directly with a single high-up administrator to basically secretly upgrade the soccer team from club to varsity, making them eligible for Division II sports by using $4,000 from the president's discretionary fund to do so. By this point, the Morehouse soccer team, for all intents and purposes, existed as its own private squad operating completely separate from the university's athletic department. They would both practice and play their games at nearby local parks or sometimes high school fields. Multiple people in the school's athletic department, including for a short time the AD himself, did not know they had a soccer team. Then the great ideas just kept coming to Augustine. For years before any of this soccer silliness, Augustine had been involved in a program that relocated West African refugees fleeing war or politics and found places for them at American universities. Augustine taught Islamic and African history, and this was of genuine importance to him. It was a good thing he was a part of for a long time before this, actually putting good into the world. I don't want to discredit that. But now, he knew he could benefit from his own good deeds. Over a small period of time, six different refugees were admitted to Morehouse College. Three of them just happened to be standout soccer players. And if that wasn't bad enough, there were also two outright professional soccer players just on the team. From 1998 to 2000, two Nigerian-born players competed for the Atlanta Ruckus of the United Soccer A-League. At the same time, these two were also playing for the Morehouse Soccer Division II team. That's not good, and even if it was, both of them actually started playing for Morehouse before they were ever enrolled in the school officially, so double not good. And by now, with rumors floating around, I swear to you, some of the staff was just coming to the realization, wait, we have a soccer team? Finally, Word reached the school's president, who took immediate and drastic action. He fired Augustine as a coach and punished the soccer program, eventually just canceling their own 2003 season upon realizing how egregious it was. Sort of a self-applied death penalty. The NCAA just came in and said, yeah, this is terrible. You guys are banned for two years, which was slapped on top of their own personal ban, making it three years total of no soccer. That changed nothing. The university had no intentions to bring the soccer team back within close to three years. And it still wasn't really a massive headline. For how big and rare the NCAA death penalty is, one of only five ever, there's very little known out there about this story. In 2006, Morehouse was once again eligible to play, but no competitive form of soccer would return to Morehouse until 2023. 
when the club team just got going again, a comeback that was only reported in the student newspaper and no further beyond. All in all, it was a mostly self-imposed 20-year ban. And that's the Morehouse story. The next death penalty wasn't quite as good a story as the rest of these, just being honest, and it weirdly came just after the Morehouse one, at an even lower level. The difference between Division 1, 2, and 3 is pretty clear-cut. Division 1 schools have certain numbers of full athletic scholarships they can give. You can get a free education to their school just for being good at a sport. Division II schools have a smaller number of scholarships to give out, and usually only give partial ones for athletes. Division III schools simply do not offer athletic scholarships, though can offer athletes varying levels of extra financial aid to play. At the D3 level, we're dealing with the smallest schools, often struggling with lack of resources. So McMurray College, in their Division III men's tennis squad, probably wasn't living in luxury, but for whatever reason that could push a Division III part-time men's tennis coach to his edge, Neil Hart got the job and wanted to win. He worked in cahoots with his own father, an evidently wealthy older man, to create a special scholarship for international students. There were no requirements needed to be eligible for the scholarship, the only stipulation being that Neil Hart himself got to handpick the student. In total, between 2000 and 2004, Hart gave away the scholarship to 10 students, covering over $120,000 of financial aid. In one of the greatest coincidences known to man, all 10 of them happened to be men's tennis players. At the start of the 2005 season, after hearing about an NCAA investigation at his school, the principal of McMurray College looked into it, found the scholarship, and instantly shut down the team, just one game into the season. The NCAA found out and pounced another two-year death penalty, but again, it didn't really matter. McMurray opted not to bring their men's tennis program back after the penalty was lifted, and we can actually close the book on this one for good, because McMurray College shut down in May of 2020 without ever bringing tennis back, meaning the death penalty in this case was permanent. That only leaves one, the last Division I team to be put down, and it explains everything that comes, or more so hasn't come, after it. Harsh, but deserved, SMU is the most infamous victim of the death penalty, and we'll go more in-depth to that story than any of the others on this board. In fact, we're gonna need some more space to do it. Get comfortable, grab a snack, this part gets a little crazy. Here you go. Thanks. I travel a lot, but you don't have to play in the NBA to visit new places and meet new people. All you have to do is pick up a book, because when you know how to read, adventures come to you. That's right, Chad. And adventures can be almost anything. From a teenage wizard finding his own in a fairy tale land, to an obscene example of corruption and greed in the world of college sports, the likes of which never seen before or since. And in David Whitford's novel, A Payroll to Meet, he dives deeper than anyone ever has into SMU's rise to the top and subsequent demise of a football empire built on sand. This isn't the book. It's a picture I printed out of it. I bought it online like a normal human, but I highly recommend it. Back to you, Shaq. Learn how to read. Now, to appreciate any glorious downfall, you need to know what was standing to begin with. And for that, you need to know the man who built it. Ronnie Meyer was the All-American boy. He was an Eagle Scout. His dad was the star football player at Westerville and married the high school homecoming queen, his mother. Ronnie was going to be the same way. He was a decent student, but earning 10 varsity letters across his high school career, the passion was clear. As a star athlete, he had Ohio State's attention for a bit, but he just didn't pass the eye test. At a skinny, unassuming 5'10", that wasn't going to be a test he was ever great at. Ronnie chased other schools. If it wasn't Ohio State, it had to be someone from the Big Ten. He had to play big-time ball. 
Then he found a winning lottery ticket in the human form of George Steinbrenner. Westerville is just a little suburb of Columbus, Ohio, a much bigger city where Steinbrenner was becoming a well-known guide to get things done. In a perfect twist of fate, he was on the football staff at Purdue University and was getting into the ear of Ronnie Meyer. Word on the street was the Boilermakers wanted Ronnie, badly. For Meyer, it was too good to be true. He had no money, he had just married his high school homecoming queen, just like his pops, and she was pregnant with their child. Before the school year of 1959, Ronnie Meyer packed up his wife and the few other things he had and left for Purdue. When he arrived, he went straight to the football facilities, introduced himself with excitement, and nobody knew who he was. Steinbrenner was nowhere in sight. Not a soul had heard the name Ronnie Meyer. He'd been swindled. You see, George Steinbrenner had served as a Purdue assistant football coach for a single season two years ago. He had very loose ties and absolutely zero powers within the Purdue football organization. But he would stay in sports, sports business particularly, and a little over a decade later made a solid investment when he bought a little baseball club known as the New York Yankees. The Steinbrenners remain majority owners of the team today. But it being the Yankees owner didn't make the trickery any cooler at the time in the eyes of Ronnie Meyer. He had literally nowhere else to turn right now. I mentioned his father briefly, star football player, homecoming queen wife, but that's not how that story ends. For Ronnie's dad, it ended at the bottom of a new bottle every night, slipping into alcoholism, mistreating his wife, and often not being there for his children. Every single day after that, Ronnie showed up to the Purdue head coach's office and begged for a chance. A scholarship, making the team manager, he'll wash laundry for you. Just a shot. Eventually, he got a shot, worked his way to third string linebacker, earned a scholarship, and by his junior year, old Ron Meyer, no more kitty nicknames, was a star, calling the signals for Purdue's defense. By his senior year, though a very solid player, the next step was obvious, including to Purdue's own staff. Ron Meyer was to be a football coach. The staff at Purdue had already started treating him as one of their own, and he took a high school coaching job straight out of college. One year there was enough to prove himself, and he was welcomed on to the Purdue staff as an assistant coach, where he'd spent five years. At Purdue, Ron Meyer established himself not as some genius football coach, but as an absolutely amazing football recruiter. A lot of people don't realize that in college sports, there's two types of great coaches. One of them can draw up plays and formations, give the locker room speech, go lead his team on the field, and then do the press conference after. This is the X's and O's guy. But the other type is the one that gets dudes to come to school there. A master recruiter. The other type isn't as much of a coach as a salesman. Ron Meyer was born to be a salesman. He was firmly on this side of the line, and he knew. Ron was charming, real charismatic when he wanted to be, and he did his homework to impress every recruit he met with how much personal information he knew about them. If it was truly a game of who put the most effort into getting a recruit and who could come up with the craziest, best ideas to persuade them, then Ron was going to win that game every time. Purdue's official football page still refers to him as their greatest recruiter ever. Even though he wasn't bad with the X's and O's of coaching, actually pretty solid at it, Ron just had some sort of special recruiting bone in his body. He had unique creative ideas and schemes to get guys through the door. That same Purdue article referred to it as flamboyant yet tireless. Recruiting is an art despite having rules and regulations, it's a wide open game with infinite possibilities. There's so many weapons to be used. It sort of becomes, how smart are you? With everything on the table, what can you do to get that high school kid in your uniform? You can say whatever you want to someone to get them to come to your school. It doesn't even have to be true. It's politician rules. Once you got them, you got them. 
Oftentimes, you have to do a little more than just talk and make promises. If you really want a kid, put on a show for him. At Purdue, Ron drove a fancy blue Corvette that he would let players drive if they agreed to help him with recruiting. That is, until Ron lent the car to one defensive tackle just to drop a recruit off at the airport and get in his ear about what it's like playing at Purdue. On the way back home, the D-tackle hit a patch of ice, slid out, and totaled the car beyond recognition, marking the end of Ron Meyer loaning out his car. But pretty quickly, the results spoke. He landed players as a young assistant college coach, nabbing Otis Armstrong, Daryl Stingley, and Dave Butts speaks volumes. The team looking like this once you arrive, and this when you're done, speaks volumes. And when you speak loud enough, you never know who could be listening. In 1971, Ron was noticed, by a lot of people probably, but by a special team in particular. The Dallas Cowboys offered him a job as a scout. The Dallas Cowboys, America's team, fresh off a Super Bowl appearance, Dallas. This is no joke. Ron took the job without hesitation. The Cowboys went right back to the Super Bowl. And this time, they didn't lose. Every single person in that organization got a Super Bowl ring. They say, after 1972, if you ever met the guy for the first time, no matter how old he was or you were, you were getting flashed by the Super Bowl ring. His hand was naked without it. Career-wise, Ron was at the mountaintop. It kind of felt like he got chucked up here and somehow skipped half the usual steps to do it, but he was a Super Bowl champion. Yet Ron wanted more. How many people would earning a glistening Dallas Cowboy World Champion ring not be enough for? Ron Meyer took Cowboy's scouting job because he would have been an idiot to pass it up. But as a man who loved football coaching to his core, he also had big hopes for the job. Meyer thought after proving himself, he'd be standing at the front of the line when the Cowboys went assistant coach shopping. Ron wanted to lead a team. He wanted to be on Tom Landry's staff. Hell, he wanted to be Tom Landry. And to make that happen, ironically enough, he had to take a step back down. Now, Purdue turned around under Meyer. He was a recruiter and assistant. We can't give him all the credit. But with the Cowboys on the resume now, too, Ron was starting to build up a bit of a reputation that where he went, football got better. But the Cowboys were already in the Super Bowl before, and Purdue at least has a solid history of football. There's a storied past there. You want a real challenge? You really want to prove yourself? Go find a lousy program. Go perform with a program like UNLV. This isn't the high levels of college football. It's not even the top shelf. The University of Nevada, Las Vegas is a Division II program. And these five seasons before Ron got there, they're not great, but they're not even good when you realize that's the school's whole football history. The 1950s were a time of change and excitement for Las Vegas. Evolving from a regional destination to a national hotspot, the Sin City was beginning to establish itself as an entertainment and gambling super hub, and in the post-World War II boom, the population was primed to explode, doubling in a seven-year period. That called for more education, more jobs, and more economic activity, all three of which could be helped by opening a university. Relatively young among its college counterparts, Nevada Southern University opened its doors in 1957. For a time dominated by nonconformity going against the norm, a rebel had the highest of reputations. For Las Vegas, no single word could have been a better fit, and less than 10 years down the line, the Rebels had their first football team. It actually started out well, almost alarmingly well, but things seemed to play out the opposite of how they should have. Nevada Southern went 8-1 and one their first season, then changed the name to UNLV, and proceeded to get worse, stay the same, get worse, and get even worse over four years. Their head coach announced his resignation, and with a recommendation from the Dallas Cowboys front office, UNLV had a guy to replace him. There was chatter among the school's administration, rumors flying around as they do. Coming off a 10-loss season, and still on the downhill slope, 
Many question the need for a football program. It's a lot of money to pour into a failing team. Thus, when Meyer signed his contract, it was for one year, and he couldn't negotiate a day longer. A prove-it deal in sports is a short, often one-year agreement for a player to determine his true long-term value to a team. Play good, and you get a nice, long, and safe contract. Ron Meyer and the entire existence of UNLV's football team were on a prove-it deal. When he got there in the spring, there was about 65 guys on the field. After the first summer, there were 130. Ron had a busy offseason. Here's how he willed a successful program into being and his strategy for doing such, in case that comes back up again. Step one, it's how you look. Image is everything. In a town like Las Vegas, it's hard to stand out. Ron Meyer stood out. He was cool in a way that looked effortless, despite being overly calculated. He wore sweaters and crewnecks made from expensive fabrics, often with a collar on underneath them. He had slacks from all shades of the rainbow, nice clean sideburns, looked like he got his hair trimmed every morning. Ron had style, a preppiness that somehow managed to come off as cool instead of douchey. He said the word mod a lot, just used it in conversation. And despite not being some big shot program or even a D1 school at all, he used what little he had at his disposal. When recruits came to visit UNLV, they didn't just get a tour from Ron, he went out and recruited all the pretty girls he could find on campus to greet his recruits upon arrival. Just when you'd start talking to him, big guarantees and everything, when he'd start to appear a little human like all the other recruiters with their empty promises, he'd flash that pretty Super Bowl ring. And just like that, he had you all over again. A promise from this guy had some diamond-encrusted legs to stand on. There was the $100 bill, his whole coaching career, not just UNLV. Ron was famously known, or a little later infamously known, for carrying a $100 bill everywhere he went. Gas station, restaurant, even just buying $3 worth of snacks at the corner store. He'd pull out his wallet and make it seem that he had to reach around the 100 to get his small bills. It was made sure everyone knew Ron was comfortable. People who knew him and didn't like him swore it was the same $100 bill all along for years that he never spent it and it was all an act. It was. But people who didn't know him? Well, it worked on them almost every time. He had style, but he also had substance. One female from the UNLV athletic department said, quote, he was good looking. He was young, he said what he wanted, and he got it done. That kind of made him bigger than life. The image was created. UNLV looked like they meant business. Step two, get the guys. Creating this great picture of UNLV wasn't just for their own confidence. That's a plus, but now it can bring dudes in. Mike Thomas was a junior running back at Oklahoma, one of the better high school players in Texas. He got to choose between big-time schools, powerhouse programs, and chose the Sooners. After two years in the Crimson and Cream, Ron Meyer somehow got the kid to believe that his best chances were not with one of the greatest college football programs of all time, but with a random Division II school fresh off a one-win season. And he wasn't even lying going to be competitive next year. Uh... In Meyer's first year, he took the team from 1 and 10 to 8 and 3. Mike Thomas led the entire country in rushing yards across every division. The next season, UNLV finished the regular season undefeated. They peaked at number 2 in the country in the Division 2 poll. They won a playoff game before being outed in the national semifinals. After another outstanding season, Mike Thomas was taken in the fifth round of the NFL draft by the Redskins. He was overlooked quite a bit due to playing Division II, not against the best guys in the country. To some professional coaches, he had taken the easy way out. In his first season, Mike Thomas rushed for over 900 yards and was named NFL Rookie of the Year. 107 players were drafted ahead of him. He hadn't taken the easy way out. You're taking the Ron Meyer way. Uh, I'm not going to say we're going to be 11 and 0. I don't like to get in the numbers game. Thomas is just one story that has similarities to dozens of other UNLV players around the time. 
Meyer got his guys in and started to win quick. He would coach only one more season at UNLV. They slightly regressed, winning seven games and losing four. But it was still accurate to say the program had taken a complete 180. Just three years after Meyer left, UNLV was moved up to Division I football. After the one-loss team Meyer inherited, they would have eight consecutive winning seasons. UNLV looked like a real football program, and now they played like one too. Ron was quietly building up a coaching resume. The turnaround that the UNLV team pulled isn't normal. Teams don't just get good randomly, and even when there's a great coach building something, it typically takes longer than a three-year stint to implement culture, get the guys you like, and actually start winning football games. Nevertheless, for the team to stay successful after you leave. Years later, after everything went down, one player from those Ron Meyer UNLV teams was asked if he was surprised about what happened with his former coach. No, he said bluntly, because I felt things moved awfully fast here, too. There were a lot of players in here really fast. That's as far as I'll go on that one. I just want you to know, JR, I'm gonna nail you. Now, haven't you noticed? You gotta be a man to play in my league. Dallas was doing great. Dallas just opened the biggest airport in the country. Its population was skyrocketing through the two millions. The Dallas Cowboys were America's team, and as we know, perennial Super Bowl contenders. And the city was flooded with newly rich and wanting to get richer oil tycoons. That just created more jobs, bolstering the economy, thus bringing more people. Bougie nightclubs and business formal restaurants appeared in masses. Dallas was urban, sophisticated, hot, and a little crazy. And Dallas, they couldn't complain. Every month, it felt like a new skyscraper was going up downtown with top floor offices for those rich elite. Those penthouse-like workplaces would be the future locations of a many shady meetings and dealings surrounding SMU football. As always in Texas, football reigned supreme, and Dallas was feeling just fine in this area. There was the Cowboys, and always a slew of great high school games under the Friday night lights to stay busy. Saturdays were just okay. It wasn't a lack of content. Dallas had schools, North Texas, TCU, and SMU are all within a nice range. More a lack of results. In the last 10 years, those three schools had made a combined one bowl game, while compiling a nice round 20 losing seasons. And maybe it wouldn't have been so hard to settle for a mediocre college football landscape if it weren't for what they were surrounded by. SMU and TCU competed in the Southwest Conference, which around them contained Texas, A&M, Baylor, Texas Tech, Houston, Rice, and Arkansas. These schools, mainly the big powerhouses out of Austin College Station, were the competition. And it wasn't a fair fight. It's just not the results you'd expect out of a place like Dallas in a sport like football. SMU specifically was a unique case. They were bad, pretty bad, only winning the Southwest Conference one time since 1949. They also had zero seasons of two losses or less from that point on. But it was the year just before that, 1948, that was the last reminder of a different era for SMU. They weren't always little brother in Texas. This is a school that produced a Heisman winner, a school with claim to a national championship just a bit before that. SMU's roots and alumni lived and breathed football. SMU had a football team decades before they had a library on campus. Over the last three decades of meh football, the vision of SMU back in this spot was slowly starting to fade. Ron Meyer could see it clearly. There was one more thing about the SMU program he inherited that he had to deal with. They were the bad boys of college football. 
it kind of sounds weird to say after stressing how awful they've been, but both are plain true. By this time, SMU had built a reputation for breaking rules over and over again. It started in 1958. Among a couple minor violations, the NCAA was able to pin SMU for an illegal employment opportunity. And this was honestly a tough call. SMU landed an all-American Texas guy, highly recruited, and they won the bidding battle. That summer, the player took a job for an SMU booster. It was an oil company, and the player would travel to rig sites around Texas, picking up and transmitting basic information. Now, in a lot of violations, recruits are often paid money for jobs they didn't do, basically just under the table cash, and that's a big no-no, a pretty common one. But this wasn't even a case of unperformed work. The job was done, and it was done by the player. The NCAA agreed on that. What they didn't like so much was how the player had gotten that job with seemingly zero necessary qualifications or background, and they deemed it special treatment of an athlete. That was serious enough to land SMU on a one-year probation term. But alright, not too bad. Stay out of trouble, and we're good until 1964, when they got slapped with a much more severe punishment, two years probation and a two year postseason ban. There was again a number of violations that started to creep more towards the edge. One player got a ride in a booster's private jet across the state to quickly see his sick mother. Another had a coach's personal car lent to him to go visit his grandmother, who was recently recovering from a heart attack. But the big one was a recruit flip. See, when the NCAA wants to investigate a program, they don't necessarily always focus on players at that program. Usually, a 19-year-old kid won't talk bad about the school he's enrolled in and playing at currently, but a good way to make them speak is to ask about a different college that they were recruited by out of high school. SMU went hard after one kid, who ended up flipping to Baylor, then told the NCAA an SMU booster offered him a car. That's bad. The team got through, but couldn't stay clean for a decade. In 1973, an intricate ring was discovered within the SMU team in which their head coach began paying players small bonuses for great plays, somewhat foreshadowing what was to come. It started with $10 per tackle on punt coverage, then it was 20 for any scout teamer who blocked a kick in practice. As soon as the school's principal found out, he shut the system down, and that was good to the NCAA. Originally, it was just going to be a little one-year probation again. But when the NCAA came to sniff around for themselves, they found a ton of other new violations, including money being given to players, and they opted to another two-year probation, this time with a two-year ban from national television games and bowl games. When Ron Meyer got there, they were about to be fresh off that third probation the third in 15 years. And instantly, Ron went to work. This wasn't Division II football anymore. Ron knew his competition. A&M, Texas, Arkansas were the powers of the Southwest, and the schools SMU hated consistently losing to. To Ron Meyer, there was no reason why SMU couldn't compete with them. If you used private school as an excuse, he'd be quick and happy to point out USC and Notre Dame holding their own as national private powers. SMU should be mentioned in the same breath as those guys. Now, out recruiting the rest of the Southwest straight up would be almost impossible. Their colors, their names, it just didn't hold the same weight or promise. The rich tend to stay rich in college football. So, how do you make the jump when you're poor? In Ron's mind, as we know, you had to use whatever you did have to your advantage. And what SMU did have was three things. They had Dallas, they had the prestige of Texas football, and as he'd come to find out a little later, they had a boatload of rich boosters willing to do anything for SMU to win. He started with Dallas. The pitch Meyer gave to his athletes and the one he ingrained in all of his staff was simple, consistent, and effective. This is Dallas. We are are Dallas. First, he hit him with a stat, something like, this high percentage of people settle down for a career right near where they went to college. That was the hook. Then, it was jammed Dallas down their throat. 
It's the seventh largest city in the country, still growing. It had more corporate headquarters than all but two cities. It put more African Americans in those corporate positions than any city in the country. We are Dallas. Dallas was the best city in the best state in the greatest goddamn country on the planet. To really sell someone, sometimes Meyer would draw attention to that little Super Bowl ring of his. If Lubbock is so awesome, he'd say with a grin, then why aren't they the Lubbock Cowboys? Lubbock is the home of Texas Tech. Just as much as Ron was talking guys into SMU, he was talking them out of any other Texas school he could. In sports, a booster is anyone who supports a team's athletic program in any way. According to the NCAA's definition, it's any representative of a school's athletic interests. The term is often, however, automatically associated with monetary support. This can be in the form of donations to the school or team, or in some other ways. One good example would be the University of Oregon and their main booster, Phil Knight, owner of Nike. Knight has given over a billion dollars to his former school, proving to be a legit and good moral booster. That's someone who does it the right way, does everything above board. A booster is fully allowed to give money to the school. In fact, if you go donate $100 somewhere right now and call yourself a booster, I promise they'll accept your money. But the greed and corruption that can go down when outside money is involved is truly amazing. Boosters start wanting to be more involved, hands-on. Sometimes they feel they deserve power after giving. In the most simplest of terms, SMU football was run by boosters. Bill Clements knew who he was. The biography that would be published on him decades later would go by the title of Texian to his toenails. Clements was Texas through and through. Growing up in the thick of the Great Depression in Dallas, he had implemented in himself a penchant for working hard to get what's yours. He was a great athlete, offered a scholarship to SMU out of high school, but times were tough. He had to help his family, and he was a worker. Clements got his hands dirty in the Texas oil fields all around the state, learning the business model in and out. He eventually did enroll at SMU, but only lasted a couple years before his will to work overtook him again. He dropped out, got back into the oil fields, went and served in World War II, came back, and started the Southeast Drilling Company, better known worldwide as Sedco. Starting off with three old used drilling rigs, Clements took the business to over 20 countries, becoming one of the bigger companies in the field and making Bill Clements a rich guy. But even though he never graduated, he still had an admiration for SMU. It was still his home, and if he loved anything, it was SMU football. In 1967, Clements took the spot of chairman of the board of governors at the school. SMU's Board of Governors was a leadership committee full of mostly alumni who met and worked on any issues at the school. However, the integrity of the SMU Board of Governors had been eaten away at for years, even decades. Well before Clements arrived, a shift started taking place in the board that wouldn't have been easy to spot at first, and by the time it was obvious what was happening, too late to stop. Slowly, the board was bleeding out any sense of diversity. And I'm not talking color and gender. This was a mainly white male board all along. But now it was full of the same person. Over the years, they weeded out the people who might have focused on academics a little too much. Their numbers of Methodists, representing Southern Methodist University's best interest, was squeezed to nearly zero. And every single new board member just happened to have some of the deepest pockets in Dallas. When Bill Clements took over as chairman, that was the final step to essential total control. The Board of Governors was full of Bill Clements's. Rich, white, cocky, professional, and rich. But if there's one thing that could bring these gentlemen all together, if you had to choose just one similarity among the many prevalent, 
you would choose their over-the-top love for SMU football. Wealthy, older gentlemen with everything to lose, but even more to risk. This was a group used to getting what they wanted, however they had to do it. The guys who, whether everyone knew it or not, sort of controlled Dallas socially, financially, and politically from the top story offices of those skyscrapers that just kept going up. It was this group of SMU boosters who were calling the shots, and by being disguised as the board of governors, they had the power and ability to control things however they wanted without being stopped. It was this group that was, in large part, responsible for the three separate probationary periods SMU had been put on and the non-stop punishments clouding the school. And it was this group that would be the reason SMU wouldn't stop violating rules, wouldn't stop being punished, and barely cared about any of it. This board of governors was playing with fire, and they had no intention of stopping Bill Clements led the board for six years, until 1973, a few years before Ron Meyer got to SMU. His net worth by then was well into the tens of millions. He stepped down from his position because, well, he got a much better one. For the next four years, Bill Clements served as the United States Deputy Secretary of Defense under Presidents Nixon and Ford, and only one person has held the position for a longer time than him in U.S. history. Clements was a proud and obvious Republican. He wanted to dump as much money into the military as possible. He was confident with his ideas, willing to go to battle over them, and his pure abrasiveness often made him come off as arrogant. In other words, Republicans loved him. Once under Nixon, a secretary gave Clements a budget proposal. As Clements took out his red ink pen and started slashing useless costs, as he so often did, the secretary nervously perked up. Sir, I hate to tell you this, she stammered, but the president has already approved this budget. All he wants is your signature. Unfazed and with no hesitation, Clements clapped back. If Dick don't like it, have him call me. Nixon never called. Bill Clements didn't care who the hell you were. He was going to do what he wanted. In October of 1905, President Teddy Roosevelt, famously a lifelong football fan, called a meeting that included athletic directors from some of the top sports schools in the country at the time, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, etc. The president told them very seriously that the game of football was going off the rails. During the 1904 season, there had been 19 deaths in the sport. This meeting was a cordial, polite way of saying, make the game safer now. For as much as he would really hate to do it, Roosevelt would be forced into abolishing the sport altogether for the people's safety. Over the next couple months, a slightly larger group of schools worked to tune up the rulebook of football, and eventually 62 colleges became charter members of the Intercollegiate Athletic Association of the United States, or IAAUS. Four years later, this group would change its name to the NCAA. Let's revisit with the overseer of college sports. We went over those first 50 years or so of relying on the literal honor system to police a multi-million dollar industry, and to everyone's dismay, that system isn't the answer. The NCAA had to start investigating themselves. Leading to now, we've seen them drop a couple death penalties, we even have spoilers on the ones to come, but what these four peaks of punishment don't show are the hundreds of small violations in between them. They don't show big schools that get away with murder, or little ones not even important enough to care about. The death penalty had not been scaring people out of cheating like it was intended to. It's been scaring them out of getting caught. The NCAA in 1906, or in the 50s, or in the 80s, or today, in 2024, does not have the ability to catch every cheater. They don't have the amount of investigators needed, they don't have the budget, they couldn't even get close. It would require someone permanently stationed at basically every high-level school, and this would start looking more like a federal operation than an NCAA inspection. And that's actually the most important piece that they're lacking. The law. 
It's not illegal. No coach or booster has ever been put in jail for paying recruits. No one gets actual time behind bars for lying about an athlete's grades or meeting with a recruit when they weren't supposed to. The NCAA has no real power or authority according to the law. Even if they are sure a school is breaking rules, they can't put people under oath and ask them with a penalty of perjury if they did it. No one has to talk to the NCAA if they don't want to. There's no secret investigation with phone tapping or anything like that. They can't do that. To actually catch a school, either the school has to be careless in some way, or more often, someone has to blab. A lot of the time, all the NCAA can legally do is sit there and hope anyone talks. I include this all to say, there's a lot more instances of a school getting away with cheating than there is them getting caught. And neither of those numbers are small. Ron Meyer got on campus in 1976. The first thing to happen was their recent probation being extended one more extra year for some more minor violations. Ron's first season would happen under probation. He paid little attention to that. He had bigger things in mind and knew this wasn't a one-year project. If there was a top prospect sitting there with an equal Texas and SMU offer on the table, 85% of the time, he's a Longhorn. So Ron Meyer had to get creative to win guys. He was already shoving Dallas down throats, so his next concrete idea was simple. Use people's prejudices against them. Most of the Texas and Southwest powerhouses were still mostly segregated. The University of Texas just lettered their first African American football player only six years ago. This was an area SMU could make up ground against those who refused to change. The scheme centered around Kashmir High and a couple other similar schools. Kashmir was an almost all-black school that other colleges were aware of but mostly ignored barring a real big-time stud. Ron Meyer made a living on Kashmir High, and he was stepping up his game in more ways. The $100 bill he would always carry around, he still had it, but now he would walk up to a bulletin board at a high school where dozens of other college coaches had already pinned their business cards. Ron would walk up to the board, pin his card up, and then pin a $100 bill in front of it. Somehow, even if Ron just left the money and no business card, I have a feeling kids would have known who stopped by. Another devious tactic was the Doc Walker Scholarship, named after SMU's former Heisman winner, which I think I'll just let Ron explain himself how this one worked. I invented a scholarship called the Dope Walker Scholarship. I said I only give it out once a lifetime, you know, type of thing. I think we had 30 up one year, but anyway. Awesome. He hired his own staff, bringing in outside people, a couple guys specializing in X's and O's, but mostly used car salesmen. Recruiting was arguably taken more serious than playing football. An average college football team has very light practices on Fridays, often called a walkthrough. They do this in part to keep guys fresh, not tire them out before a game, but also to clear assistant coaches' schedules. Friday night, of course, these guys flutter out to their respective recruiting area and watch some high school games. Ron Meyer took this system, which is seen as routine, and turned it up to 11. Thursday nights, his coaches would leave early to be where they had to be all day on Friday. Arriving before the high school games gave them a chance to watch some film, talk to a recruiter, his family, wish him good luck, and know what he needed to know. Unprepared would be the dead last word you'd use to describe Ron's staff. He'd personally make sure of it. Though he chased salesmen and had a couple great ones on staff, no SMU coach could recruit quite like Ron himself. He had the swagger, the mojo, it was all still there. But plenty of recruiters had that. Texas and TCU had swagger. What set Ron apart was the kids actually liked him. It's really easy to play the cool guy walking around confidently, have everything figured out, and come off as a completely unrelatable douchebag to a high school kid. That's exactly how a lot of them work, but with Ron, he just got kids to believe he was really on their side, just like he really was with Mike Thomas at UNLV. 
Ron would meet a kid's parents, aunts, and uncles, eat dinner with them around the family table. He'd catch them before game time with a quick good luck champ, a seemingly random and polite gesture that was actually meant to make the kid know you were there and watching and cared about him. He was a master at the whole charade of recruiting. Like everything he did, it somehow looked effortless while having so much time and thought put into it. Over a decade later, an SMU booster said the first time he saw actual money passed from a college coach to a high school player was in 1977. We were recruiting at Cashmere High. We talked to a bunch of kids that day. I can't pin it down, but it was maybe 20 or 50 bucks or something like that we gave one of the players. I don't even remember who it was now, but it did strike me as, huh, well... I was sort of getting the idea at that time that this was more than just a selling job. If Meyer and his new SMU staff had spent all their time and focus on recruiting rather than the team they did currently have in front of them, it showed that first year. Week 1 of the 76 season was against TCU, a great test, one of the smaller private Texas schools, same situation. The big dogs were one thing, these were going to be challenges, but TCU, Rice, Baylor, these are games they can and need to win. Hopes weren't too high for SMU, they only got worse when Ron Meyer and their all-important last week of practice leading up to the game insisted on spending hours choreographing the Mustangs entrance and warm-up for week one, which infuriated players and staff alike, but Ron knows how important image is. SMU won 34-14. They looked like a centipede out of the tunnel, all in unison, a clean, professional statement of a stretching routine. When you look the part, it just may trick some people into thinking you can play it. They lost their next game to Alabama by 53 points, then lost seven more out of their next eight. Ending the season with a win over Arkansas was nice, if not a band-aid on the gunshot wound. The next year wasn't much better for SMU, improving by a game to go 4-7, and seven. but to be fair, this is what turning around a program looks like more realistically. You don't usually start to see the effects of a new college coach till around year 3. UNLV was almost a fluke with how quick it all happened. By now, Meyer and his whole team were pretty entrenched in the recruiting game, which brought good and bad news. Starting happy, they were now able to land some actual studs. Mike Ford, probably the best among them. An all-state quarterback from Texas, Ford was ran after hard by the University of, but Ron Meyer just straight up out-recruited them. Ford says it himself, Texas only talked about the past while SMU the future, and it definitely didn't hurt that Ron won over Mike Ford's mother as well, having her push for SMU. And Mike Ford only highlighted what was a solid, well-rounded class on par with just about anyone. But on the negative side of things, well, I guess it was only negative if you took it that way, was that quickly the truth of recruiting in Texas football had become clear to them. It was a shady, dirty, law-dodging ring of corruption. And Ron Meyer decided to spin this in the most positive way possible. Let's revisit the boosters. You know Bill Clements, and he runs the show when he's around, but right now with him off in DC, what happens? Let me introduce you to one SMU booster who basically negates the need for me to introduce you to any other ones. Because they're all just a little bit of Sherwood Blunt. Sherwood represents a generation of new wealth in Texas. Younger than your normal oil tycoon, but richer as well, he had found a cleaner, nicer way to make money. Real estate. The good times in Dallas meant lots more people wanting to live there, putting more houses up, and giving Sherwood more places to sell. He'd be captured in Texas Monthly, with the words American Dream bolded next to his face. That article was about his first million. He would make a lot more of them. Blunt was a star athlete, playing football at SMU and becoming a co-captain at the linebacker position. For an idea on just how young he was to be so rich, when Sherwood was at SMU, he was looked at by the Dallas Cowboys by a scout named Ron Meyer. 
but rather than stay in football, he started making money, a fortune that amassed over $30 million at its peak, even larger than the eight-figure net worth of Bill Clements. Nowadays, Sherwood had the personality of a Cadillac, if that's at all possible. Not too dissimilar from Meyer's mod demeanor. I mean, does this picture not give big Ron Meyer vibes? He was only 27 years old, with enough money to die on and wanting something to spend it on. And Ron found an excellent friend in Sherwood Blunt. To be more accurate, he found a mutualistic relationship. Sherwood wants to be close to the team. He wants the prestige of being friends with Coach for the players to look up to him. And Ron could use hundreds of thousands of what Sherwood had to offer. And Sherwood wasn't the only one who would break rules. A lot would. All the boosters had a lot of money to play with. A good amount of them had a lot of power. For just an idea on the status of people we're dealing with here, one booster was the ex-husband of Maureen Kane, who would later become a household name nationwide during Watergate. Another booster personally knew Jack Ruby, the man who killed Lee Harvey Oswald. These were men of importance. Plenty of people have said it before. SMU football in the 70s and 80s was an unofficial oligarchy controlled right here by the boosters on the board of governors. It was their squad. SMU players would refer to these guys in the small power group as the team owners, only half-jokingly. They consistently met with the coaching staff, had seats on the team playing, watched games from the sidelines, and sometimes, if they were lucky, were even able to talk Coach Meyer into telling them what the first play was, so they could brag to their buddies about knowing. There wasn't a group on the planet who wanted SMU to win more than these guys. There also wasn't a group who was willing to help as much. The 78 season saw a similar story on the field. Ron Meyer saw it as a win because his first goal in terms of gameplay was accomplished. SMU beat TCU, Baylor, and Rice for private school supremacy. They had to prove they were out of these guys' leagues if they wanted to be in the top half of the conference. And off the field, recruiting took yet another step up. The boosters were getting real involved too. SMU felt they had to try a little extra hard just to be in contention. If it wasn't possible to beat Texas Tech or UT straight up, well then you'd meet a kid at the airport, and now quoting an SMU booster, we had to be up front. We basically bribed players to come visit. We handed out small amounts of cash, $20 bills, not thousands or anything like that. End quote. By the time kids actually were in Dallas to visit, any barriers that may have existed collapsed. A booster would meet the recruit, comp their flight at the airport, maybe buy him a nice meal or a snazzy outfit. They get in their fancy car, often a Corvette or a Datsun, and drive the kid around town to the stadium, making sure to point out any location that that booster just happened to own. They gave him the Dallas pitch, and while looking right at it, said this could be you one day. You could be me. This is Dallas, baby. In the backseat of a Corvette, a lot of minds were entranced by that. The actual visit would almost surely consist of more shopping for the athlete, tab picked up, of course, by the booster. They wanted to buy a nice present for their mother, maybe some jewelry for a girlfriend. No sweat, it's on SMU. Just one way, we take care of you here. The NCAA did allow a small budget for entertainment expenses for an athlete. That budget was $20 a visit. Saying they went over that would be redundant. Saying they were constantly into the thousands of dollars per visit may begin to paint the picture. That same booster from earlier recalled a fiction-like story of a basic recruiting trip to Kashmir High. When he got there, there was a whole group of his usual guys, the kids who knew what to expect when they saw this particular SMU booster walk on campus. As he approached them, in an act that was clearly rehearsed, they simultaneously burst out singing, Here Comes Santa Claus. What else could he do but laugh? And I can't stress enough how much SMU was doing what everyone else was doing, at least especially in Texas and the Southwest Conference. I'm not saying that makes it okay or more understandable that they cheated, I'm just giving you all the facts. Here's every football team punished for major violations in the year of 1978. Now, 
Now, SMU was sort of intentionally more open with their violations because in their eyes, they had to be to have a chance. Guys had to know SMU was also playing the game. It was routine to lose out on a recruit because they admitted they had better offers to play elsewhere. One guy, when meeting with Ron Meyer himself, had a piece of paper laid across the table to him. It had a number on it. The recruit looked at it and said, Coach, that's not even close. Other schools had more to offer. This is when the relationship of Ron Meyer and Sherwood Blunt really has the potential to shine. Again, it wasn't just Sherwood. I am using him as a stand-in for 10 or so names that were all doing the same stuff. Saying Sherwood was the most involved, both personally and monetarily, isn't fact, but it seems like a safe assumption. However, he wasn't the only one, and he wasn't even the one you would call the ringleader of it all. From an anonymous SMU booster at the time, there was only one guy who quote-unquote built the organization to do the funding for the football players, and then went out and recruited the football players and funded them. They, the boosters, were basically bagmen. That's all they were. I mean, they were just delivering the bucks. They could raise some money, I'm sure they probably did. But they were not the instigators. They were not the ones that put the thing together. Ron Meyer is the one who basically got all these people together and said, here's what we can do. And here's how we can do it. When this anonymous booster says the thing, he's talking about a slush fund, a secret reserve of money kept outside the school's records for illicit purposes. If SMU didn't have the money to compete with the big dogs, if that was the issue holding them back, Ron Meyer was going to fix it. In Texas in 1979, there was two running backs that everyone in the state Everyone in the country wanted bad. When SMU got the commitment from Craig James, it was awesome. Craig basically had his choice of where to go, where to live, and he chose SMU over everyone. Sure, there is the fact that his girlfriend enrolled at SMU a year earlier, which gave them a huge advantage, but to that, I say, would you really put recruiting a star football player's girlfriend past Rod Meyer? But then, when SMU had a legit shot at Eric Dickerson, everyone's eyes widened. When the booster who had been working on Eric for a while now left his house just a few days before signing day, he was feeling confident. Everything pointed towards Eric being a Mustang. That booster woke up the next day to a shocking report. Dickerson had committed to Texas A&M. On the cover page was a big shot of Eric in a brand new shiny car, the now infamous gold Pontiac Trans Am. Now the recruiting story of Eric Dickerson could be its own whole video, but the spark notes are as follows. He was the top recruit in the country, ahead of guys like Marino and Elway. Everyone wanted him, and A&M got it, but Eric never really wanted to go to Texas A&M. He felt pressured, and he went through a dirty and vicious recruiting process that had him being threatened and manipulated constantly. Pretty quickly after verbally committing to A&M, he was back to being unsure. SMU swooped in instantly, won over his great aunt and mother, and got Eric to flip. For decades, Eric stayed silent on the matter, claiming no one offered him money and his grandma bought him the car. Finally, in 2022, he published his autobiography, in which he only then admitted a Texas A&M booster bought him the car, known commonly now as the Trans A&M, in exchange for his commitment. He also revealed he was offered a straight-up briefcase of $50,000 cash from the Aggies and varying amounts of money from almost every school that recruited him. However, he has stayed put to the story that SMU never offered him any money during the process. Dickerson pulled up in Dallas to the front gates of SMU, driving that same gold Trans Am. And somewhere in Texas, an A&M booster was irate. And he couldn't even get his car back. Eric had all the leverage. The corruption was layered and profound beyond imagination. Eric eventually sold the car to an SMU teammate because, well, he happened to get a nicer one from an SMU booster. Ron Meyer was able to convince the two best running backs in Texas, maybe the country, 
that their best college chances were splitting carries in the exact same backfield. And he wasn't even lying. This was the Pony Express departing the station. We got the toughest darn team in the whole Southwest. We're the SMU Mustang men. We're going to win some games, but we won't say when. Our greatest heights are yet to be known. We got all In 1978, SMU's athletic department decided on a new promotional slogan to increase game attendance, which had been faltering at best. People like to say, in Dallas, the Cowboys had an unofficial monopoly on football support. Then Mustang Mania was introduced. There was the new fight song of the same name. There was hundreds of thousands of stickers and posters and t-shirts everywhere you look downtown telling you where to be on Saturdays. And there was the biggest single year attendance increase in all of college football. SMU was thinking things through. A lot of other schools had been getting caught for large upfront payments to players. A couple thousand extra dollars out of nowhere or a brand new car showing up in the driveway was enough to set off alarm bells. So SMU started playing the long game. In a routine reminiscent of money laundering, the school would slowly give a couple hundred dollars to a player or their family or both every month. Enough to make a difference and definitely add up, but not enough where any one single payment stood out. Generally, an SMU coach would show up to one of those downtown Dallas skyscrapers, take the boring elevator ride all the way to the top office, and meet a booster. Not much words would be exchanged in these meetings. The actions were more important. The booster would reach his hand into his desk and pull out an envelope. It would be stuffed. He'd hand it over to the coach. That SMU coach, whichever one it happened to be that day, would generally go, quote-unquote, from house to house in some of the poorest neighborhoods in Houston or Dallas, like an insurance collector. Only, he wasn't collecting. He was paying. End quote. The coach made the rounds of a lot of beat-up places he could tell needed the money. People's faces lit up when they saw him. They relied on this cash. It made whoever was dropping the money feel like they were truly doing a good thing. When the SMU coaches stressed they would take care of you in Dallas, it wasn't a lie at all. As tends to go, life happens. A kid couldn't predict every expense he was going to have. Sometimes something random popped up he had to take care of. If his monthly allowance couldn't cover it, any booster, just a phone call away, would be delighted and excited to help out. Car problems? Surprise, Bill? Got yourself in some trouble? There was nothing a booster and a nice thick envelope couldn't solve. In 79, they got a little better. Some key injuries helped spoil the show, but in 1980, it premiered. Anyone who had been watching SMU keeping up on their recruiting and Ron Meyer wasn't surprised. They knew Pony success was imminent. But if you only watched the games and looked at power rankings like most fans... Then it was just now that SMU had officially arrived. The Dickerson James backfield would go on to become one of the greatest and most famous in college history. The two headed monster would earn the nickname Pony Express as they both stayed all four years and ran for over 8,000 combined yards in college. In week seven of this year against Big Texas, Ron Meyer made a coaching decision. He pulled out his guy Mike Ford as the starting QB. He put in a true freshman and switched the offense to an option the week of the game to let his revolutionary backfield shine. Lance McElhaney's first snap under center as a starter comes against the number two team in the country, the University of Texas. Texas was undefeated and ranked second in the country. SMU won 20-6. Ron Meyer was carried off the field that day. After the 1980 season, SMU finished tied for second in the Southwest Conference. They were ranked 20th in the country in the AP poll. And with no active probation, that meant they got a bowl game. It's the, most the Holiday Bowl would probably rank just outside of the main five or six in terms of prestige. No one's arguing that it's a cotton, rose, or sugar, but for an SMU team that hadn't competed in any bowl game in 12 years, it may as well have felt like that. 
This was actually only the third year of the Holiday Bowl. The two years before, BYU had lost both games, and BYU was back for the charm. They were led by Jim McMahon. SMU dominated the game through and through. With four minutes left, they led 38-25. to Then, Craig James broke a 42-yard touchdown run. SMU 45, BYU 25. As the BYU fans started pouring out of the stadium, their quarterback, Jim McMahon, began frantically yelling at everyone that the game wasn't over. No one listened. BYU scored a quick touchdown. They recovered an onside kick and scored again. They got a quick stop and forced an SMU punt. They blocked the punt. With 13 seconds left from SMU's 41-yard line and down by 6, BYU had a shot. After two incomplete passes, the clock was at three seconds. They leaned on the most beautiful play in sports. When the Hail Mary went up, it was more than a prayer. Four SMU defenders surrounded one lone BYU tight end. As soon as he caught it, and SMU had lost the game, the 1980 Holiday Bowl became an automatic shoe-in for any list of the greatest bowl games ever. This was a heartbreaking loss, no way around it, but... In a broader scope, making the Holiday Bowl was out of anyone's expectation for this program. They were on a great uphill path towards the mountaintop. Now SMU had a little success. They had some swag to their strut. This whole system working so well began to breathe the slightest bit of arrogance into the Dallas air. Air that already had an abundance of cocky personalities. They just wanted more. The city itself was still on cloud nine. They were still growing. The economic and property markets were still trending up. You could even say things were getting better. Now they had college football. The highest rated show on television in 1981 was Dallas, a dramatic soap opera that introduced the country to the inner workings of the Dallas oil industry and all the greed and corruption and maliciousness that came with it. I like to pretend that SMU was being run by characters from the Dallas TV show, and it's not that far a stretch. And now, Dallas had its hand in the state government. Remember, Bill Clements used to run the Board of Governors, now working in the White House? Well, his gig ended there, and he came back deciding to run for governor of the whole damn state. And about a year ago, he was elected as the first Republican governor in the state of Texas since 1870. The city of Dallas had their guy kicking it up in the governor's mansion. The 81 season had everyone excited about SMU. Potential was very high. Mustang mania was a contagious virus and spread rapidly. Ron Meyer knew the buzz was out there, and he also knew it was 100% accurate. He did have a squad this year. Built off the third year in a row of some of the best recruiting in the country, even Ron, the guy who wore suede shoes and was always cooler than anyone, could feel the pressure. A couple months before the much hyped up 1981 season, Ron Meyer walked into his barbershop. The Mustang, it was called, was a very normal stop for Ron. A guy that liked to look as good as he did required a fresh trim up and nice shoe shine almost weekly. But today, Ron's mood was odd. He was somewhat reserved, a word most would never use for Ron Meyer. He was holding an envelope in his hand. One of the barbers decided to make a cheeky little comment. Hey coach, he said, what have you got there? Automobile titles? The barber was expecting maybe a chuckle and guilty smile. Ron didn't laugh. He stood up and walked out of the barbershop. Ron would never go back to the Mustang again. A couple hours later, that very same day, the world learned what Ron Mayer already knew. SMU was being investigated, once again, by the NCAA for rules and fractions. As soon as they were back on top, on par with the rest of the Texas Powers and Southwest Conference, no one believed SMU could have done it legitimately, least of all the NCAA. A lot of people in Dallas were angry when they heard the news, but... Anyone who had an understanding of SMU football couldn't say they were surprised. Over 80 violations were investigated. They were able to make 29 of them stick. None were crazy on their own. One recruit was taken to play racquetball on a visit, which the NCAA deemed an illegal workout, arguably a stretch. 
I know there was caught taking more than the three allowed visits to SMU, and a third recruit was proven to have been given a $10 bill on campus. Any of these alone wouldn't have amounted to much, but finding 29 of them at once, the pure quantity did constitute this as a case of major violations. The punishment was harsh, but it's hard to say it was unfair. Two years probation, and a one-year ban from all bowl games and national television. An absolute gut punch to Mustang Mania. This team was supposed to do it. They could win the conference. Some seriously saw a national championship opportunity this year. It was a win-now team. Now, even if they did win, it was for nothing. While Dallas reeled over the news, refusing to accept it, Ron Meyer sat there. I can't get into the guy's head, but I imagine somewhere in there was relief. Ron knew what the NCAA found was bad. He knew the punishment sucked. But he also knew that they had hardly scratched the surface of the obscene violations occurring every single day all around Dallas in the SMU football program. It was as if Ron Meyer and SMU were just investigated for their murders. But all the cops could find were a couple parking tickets. SMU's 1981 squad has been called the greatest team no one ever saw. Attendance decreased without the possibility of hope. No national television games meant a lot of the country literally never got to see them play. With no light at the end of the tunnel, the Mustangs played just as hard in the dark. They started the season 6-0, winning those games by a combined score of 236-85. to After a tough loss against Texas, SMU won out. They won the Southwest Conference. The National Coaches Poll never ranks teams on probation, so SMU was excluded. But on the AP poll, they finished the season 5th in the country. One poll even designated them as co-national champions, a title SMU still claims to this day. Winning the conference would have given them an automatic bid in the Cotton Bowl. Due to the bowl ban, Texas, who finished second in the conference, got the invite and beat Alabama. There was a lot of emotions after the season concluded. Bittersweet describes it decently. A one-loss season, their first outright conference championship in 15 years, but so much unknown. So much they maybe could have had, but we'll never find out for sure. However, the Pony Express backfield of Dickerson and James were both juniors. They were each coming off their best college season yet, and each intended to stay for their senior year. Hope was coming back into the picture. This wasn't our year. Next year was. But what absolutely no one knew at the time was that the man who willed them here, Ron Meyer, had just coached his last football game ever for SMU. Ron Meyer's departure was a sad day in Dallas. The man may have been too good at his job, beyond recruiting basically anyone he wanted to SMU, it seems like he had accidentally sold the entire city of Dallas a little lie as well. The fans thought Ron could be there forever, this was his team, he made it into what it is. If he wanted to run it, no one was taking it away. But no one should have believed for one second that Ron Meyer's ultimate goal was anything except the NFL. He knew it from his first day as a Cowboys scout all those years ago, seeing the pro league, their sole purpose of football, as he put it. Ron had to coach there with the best of the best, and he'd earned it. When the New England Patriots offered him the job, even though they were 2-14 the prior season and SMU seemed like a natty contender, there was never a question. Ron was an NFL coach. SMU lost its guy, not just their head coach, but the one who set up, organized, and run this whole complex system of recruiting, much of it completely against NCAA rules. Someone had to take the reins and step in. A ship doesn't stay on course without a captain. You may think, well then, hire a new coach, and they did that. Bobby Collins was brought in to run the team, but not every coach was Ron Meyer. I don't know if any other ones were. 
Bobby was an X's and O's guy, the opposite of what Meyer would have recruited for his staff, but that by no means implied he was a bad coach, coming off unprecedented success at a mediocre Southern Missouri program. When it came to recruiting, though, Bobby wasn't as involved as Ron. When he started to realize the depths of the system that ran his new football team, he didn't take a moral high road. It wasn't a thought process of, we need to stop cheating and clean this program up. It was more that Bobby Collins didn't want or know how to get that involved. His mindset towards SMU recruiting and towards the boosters was, you guys bring me the athletes, however you have to do it, and I'll coach them to being a good football team. Bobby would shut his eyes to anything that wasn't pertinent to on-the-field football. Generally, you'd call it a transition of power from Meyer to Bobby Collins, but Collins wasn't wielding all that power. Someone stepped in to make up for that. Before the 82 season, Sherwood Blunt was a common sight in the old office that used to belong to Ron Meyer. Again, from the book, because I can't say it any better, the place to find Sherwood was, quote-unquote, with his feet on Meyer's desk, his hand in Meyer's box of cigars, given every appearance of running the show. The power held by the boosters, already far too much, was only growing. The 1982 team that Ron Meyer had built and Bobby Collins got to lead was quite a show. The senior year of the Pony Express dominated. SMU had what could easily be called their greatest team ever. With an undefeated season and second consecutive Southwest Championship, SMU's only blemish was a tie against Arkansas. They earned a Cotton Bowl bid again, and this time got to accept it, beating a senior Dan Marino-led Pittsburgh in a New Year's Day game. Penn State, despite having a loss, was named the national champion and the number one seed. One official source did name SMU national champions, and they do still claim this one as well. SMU had made it to the mountaintop. This was their peak. No other way to say it. Now how long can you stay at that peak? Obviously, not as long as they would have liked. The Ron Meyer glory days swooped to a quick, unwanted ending. It didn't fall apart immediately. Another shared conference title and two more bowl appearances were fun rides, but when you're not bringing in the guys you used to, it's impossible to maintain. On the bright side, probation expired, but let's not pretend like being on probation stopped the monthly payments or shady recruiting, the train was still moving. The 83 recruiting class was not bad at all, though spoiler alert, I guess, 8 of their 22 commits were later found to be offered monthly salaries from SMU. Two of these players on unofficial contracts were David Stanley and Sean Stopperich. We'll get back to them. Oh, would, would you look at that? Another NCAA investigation is active. That was quick. This one would continue for a whole year before the NCAA announced it was to continue indefinitely. Things were just getting started. Heat was growing. And I know I've said it a lot, but it's worth repeating that outside of SMU, cheating was maybe at its worst ever in this period, especially in the Southwest Conference. Texas, Texas A&M, TCU, and Texas Tech were all punished in some way for major violations between 1983 and 88. It could be argued the SMU wasn't cheating, they were competing. In 1984, an article was released in a local Dallas paper reporting on a shocking number of nice cars being driven by SMU athletes. Even weirder, all of these cars seemed to come from the same dealership, one owned by an extremely prominent SMU booster. In total, 15 football and basketball players were reported to have been driving newer cars from the same dealership, with 8 of those 15 cars being Datsun 280 or 300s. Not a cheap ride. So I guess that's something to keep in mind. After Bill Clement's term as governor ended and he failed in his re-election efforts, the position of chairman of the board of governors was his for the taking. And he did just that, stepping in seamlessly with the exact same mindset all these guys had. The mindset all these guys looked up to. 
If there was anything he wasn't aware of with SMU's recruiting operation, he would have quickly been brought up to speed by Sherwood and other boosters. SMU's school president organized a meeting with Bill Clements, the Power Boosters, and some essential football staff somewhere around this time. The people in the know, to put it. Where he basically told them, we need to stop payments for the good of SMU. This was a man who, although partaking in some shady actions, did have the school's best interest in mind and realized this was going off the rails and becoming too much to contain. It was time to shut it down and stop paying football players. Now, I don't have the word-for-word -word transcripts on this meeting, but I do know one sentence for sure that left the mouth of Bill Clements. He didn't want to stop paying, and he disagreed with the school's president. When pushed, Clements snapped. Shut up and go run the university. According to those present, it wasn't the first time he had said something like that to the face of the man in charge. But the president was only in charge on paper. He knew who sat across from him. He knew who Bill Clements was. He knew where the power and leverage truly lied. Without much of another choice, he listened. After all, that was nowhere near the most powerful man Bill Clements had ever stood up to. When the season ended with a bowl win and shared conference title, SMU closed out a four-year period where they were the winningest major college football team in the country. Number one, above Texas, Nebraska, Bama, Penn State, anyone. No one was more consistently good than the Mustangs right now. They really had done it. But even though they continued racking up accolades, the tide had already turned. Just like it usually takes a couple years to see the effects of a new college coach, when a program starts to fall apart from the inside out, it'll take a sec for the on-the-field results to reflect that. The investigation was still active. The NCAA, having common sense, knows what's going on, but not having the ability to compel testimony and all that jazz, no real legal authority, remember, they're struggling to find dirt on SMU. At one point, completely on his own volition, because he can't be forced into it, Sherwood Blunt agreed to meet with the NCAA. A kingpin willingly invited them into his office. The exact specifics of this meeting are again unknown, but we have one quote from Sherwood that I feel sums it up. Speaking to the literal NCAA investigating his school, he said, quote unquote, I can damn well spend my money how I damn well please. And if the NCAA disagreed, they were, again quoting, a bunch of communists. Now, this meeting made it clear to the NCAA exactly who they were dealing with and what they were going to have to put up with, but that's exactly what was supposed to happen. You see, this was a classic sleazy Dallas businessman move. Bill Clements is the one who masterminded this meeting. He wasn't present for it, but it was him who convinced Sherwood to meet with the NCAA. Why? Well, Clements and a couple other guys at the top had a plan. With the NCAA investigation hot and countless loose ends out there, SMU was in trouble. The NCAA had the ability to come down hard on them, and Clements was fearing that would happen. His plan was to turn on the boosters. Not all of them, but he wanted to single out a small group and pin 100% of the blame for SMU's shadiness on them. Then, if they just banned these trouble boosters, the program would be clean. And one of the men he wanted to take the blame was Sherwood Blunt. Clements getting Sherwood to meet with the NCAA was pure genius. He knew Sherwood would act crazy and say something insane, exactly as he did. His arrogance was used against him. A little later, Clements, Sherwood, and anyone else at the top had another meeting. This time, Clements was direct. He told Sherwood to his face that he had to get out of the program. It was for the good of SMU. Sherwood was truculent. Fine, he screamed. You want us out? We'll go. He was speaking for all of the boosters himself. Sherwood knew the truth. He saw what Clements was scheming, but SMU still had players on contracts actively being paid. It didn't matter if they cut ties with boosters or not. That was the glaring issue. 
keep paying players and risk getting caught or stop paying them and risk unpredictable 20-year-olds fresh out of money going blabbing to the NCAA. That's when Sherwood dropped the bomb. You've got a payroll to meet, he announced. Maybe you should consider adding a line item to the university budget. Everyone sitting in the room knew he was right. But this wasn't about cleaning up the program. It was about making the NCAA think they were cleaning up the program. In April of 1985, SMU's president signed formal letters entirely disassociating nine different boosters from SMU football. These were known as the Naughty Nine. Originally, the names were kept private, but within a couple of years, they were released. Their punishments ranged from two-year suspensions to lifetime bans from any involvement in SMU athletics. Sherwood got a lifetime ban. The team he loved so much and just wanted to see win. The team he had given tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to, over and under the table. SMU did all they could to get the heat off their back and make it look like they cared. Hopefully, the NCAA would buy that load of BS. Sean Stoprich was from small town Pennsylvania. His family didn't have a lot of money, and when the six foot four behemoth boy made a high school All American team, everyone was excited. He was always going to go to Pittsburgh. They were just a hop and a skip away from the Pitt campus. It wouldn't be too crazy expensive for mom and dad to go catch some games. It was Pitt all the way. Then Sherwood Blunt started recruiting Stopperich. Blunt checked into a hotel right near the family's home in Pennsylvania. He walked over, not a good meeting with the whole gang. When Blunt, wa when Blunt walked out of the house, Sean Stopperich was holding a post-dated letter of intent ready for his signing, and had verbally agreed to go to SMU. The details of this meeting, not made public until a couple years later, went as follows. Blunt handed over $5,000 cash, straight up. The offer included a $300 monthly allowance for Sean and $500 monthly for the family. Sherwood could also hook Sean's dad up with a job all the way in Dallas, and he could give the entire family a free home in Dallas. All of a sudden, Sean Stopperich was a Mustang. In his senior year of high school, Sean was injured, and it never quite healed right. He came to SMU, his family took the free house in Dallas, and his dad worked the job Sherwood got him. He was definitely on the team. That was made clear by his flashy new car, but Sean never played in a game for SMU. Through freshman practices, he lost a step and lost the spark. He left the football team and dropped out of SMU. His whole family moved right back to Pennsylvania and went back to living paycheck to paycheck. It was 1984 when the news broke that Sean Stopperich was talking to the NCAA. After well over a year of investigating, they'd finally found someone who would tell them something. Before the 85 season, SMU got hit with their fifth probation in 11 years. It wasn't friendly. Mainly leaning on Sean Stopperich, the NCAA found 125 allegations. Of those, they were found responsible for over 50 of them. Three years probation, with a two-season bowl ban, a one-season national TV ban, and 45 scholarships lost over two years. It was the harshest non-death penalty sanctions ever given by the NCAA. That would offer a decent explanation for the 1985 and 86 seasons. They knew for certain that Sean Stopperich had been paid a good amount of money. What they didn't know, the reality that would come to light not much long after, was that at least 12 others were still actively receiving payments. By now, they weren't offering any new recruits money at least, it was only the ones currently on the team being paid. We were back to the question of continuing these payments they had already promised players, the guys who were unofficially locked into this payroll, basically under contract. If they stopped cold turkey, they worried at least one player would blab. But if they just kept paying these dudes whatever they were promised and made no new promises, then in a few years, all paid players would be off the team and SMU would actually be clean. They could get the NCAA off their backs. 
So that's what they chose. Oh, and guess who funded it? You can't ban Sherwood. The men controlling SMU's football team, led by the former governor of the state of Texas, made the conscious decision to continue payments directly after being punished by the NCAA. And I don't know if it's irony or just funny, but this truly wasn't a choice fueled by corruption or wanting to have a good football team anymore. They actually thought this was in the school's best interest. Not long after SMU was slapped with their newest punishments, the NCAA called an emergency meeting. The utter volume of cheating in college sports needed to change. It was a fact that definitely included, but also extended far beyond SMU. At this meeting, the NCAA decided to reinforce a power that they already had. Shutting down an athletic program for a whole year, or even two, was something that had been done before on two occasions, but they wanted to clear up when and why this punishment would be used. Enter the repeat violator rule. Giving much more obvious criteria, this rule states that if any school is found guilty of two or more violations within a five-year period, then they are immediately eligible for a full season cancellation. As media reported on this new rule, it would quickly garner the nickname of the death penalty. Many felt that this rule had been targeted at, or at least crafted around, SMU football, which, yeah, that's not crazy to think. But even if the NCAA came out and fully admitted it was aimed at SMU, could you blame them? The 1985 season was numb, but worse than that, it was devoid of hope. When you can't give out a single scholarship, the team that very year might not be affected too bad, but it put the future of your program at odds. Players feel there's nothing to compete for. Granted, there literally was nothing to compete for with the bull ban. SMU football was just raw. I mean, how do you get yourself excited as a player here? It was dark, cloudy days, and it only seemed like more ahead. Despite their current probation and sanctions, $47,000 would be paid out to 13 different players in the 1986 school year. SMU had strayed from the perfectly executed, assembly line-like recruiting system of Ron Meyer. This was now an uncoordinated mess that simply wouldn't last long. Both regimes were cheating and breaking rules, one was just a lot better at doing it. One woman from the athletic department was fired over the course of the year. Angry and knowing countless SMU secrets, she threatened to sue, and some boosters had to pay her off under the table. Close call. Then, their underlings started rebelling. Two SMU football players broke into an administrator's office, someone they knew handed out payments to players. In his desk drawer, they found an envelope of cash, a full month's payments for multiple players, and they stole it. Eventually, the two kids got caught and they just refused to give the money back. They knew the administration would not dare take actions against them. They had the power, and they knew it. The kids were let off the hook unpunished. Things were turning upside down. This was more resembling a mafia operation than a collegiate football team. Before the 1986 season in June, John Sparks, a local Dallas news reporter with the most news reporter name I've ever heard, received a tip. It said there was lots more still going on at SMU. That tip led them to David Stanley. Stanley was a star in high school, an angry, plain to hurt type of guy. When SMU landed him after offering a monthly contract of cash payments, he could be described as a little off. SMU didn't care. They nabbed Stanley in the 83 recruiting class. Before he ever arrived in Dallas, when he was still a high schooler, Stanley would develop a nasty drug habit. Through his freshman and sophomore years, Stanley was on the team. He did get some playing time, but eventually his attitude and dependency grew too much. He was spending most of his $400 cash allowance on drugs, meaning SMU boosters were now actively funding a 20-year-old's drug addiction. Stanley decided he wanted to transfer out, get to a team with a bit of a brighter future. A completely fair request. He left SMU but Stanley's future was looking just as dim as SMU's right now. No one wanted him struggling mentally and substance-wise. He tried to come back and play for SMU, but they wouldn't take him anymore. Bobby Collins said he didn't want anyone who had quit on his team once before. It wasn't fair to the guys who had stayed. 
So David Stanley moved back home, resentful, boiling, and out of options. When a news crew approached him with questions about SMU paying players, he was more than willing to take his old school down now. The news of Stanley talking was bad. No way around it. It went public. SMU was paying Stanley and his family monthly. What really mattered, though, was when the payments were made. If they were sent out after SMU's most recent probation, then the school would be eligible for the new death penalty. The news station had given Stanley and his mother lie detector tests while asking questions about them receiving payments. They both passed. Pressure grew. What happened next could have only been foreseen by Admiral Akbar. It's a trap. It was an on-camera interview with five people. John Sparks and a colleague were reporting. SMU's head football coach, Bobby Collins, along with their athletic director and recruiting coordinator, sat on the other side. All three knew the entire real truth of the program. Doing this was an overt risk to the career of both newscasters as well as the entire news station. Dallas, both socially and financially, was controlled by SMU alumni. The Dallas Times-Herald, which had reported the Sean Stopperich story, was eventually bought out by its main competitor in 1991, a fall many attribute to them going after SMU. The reporter in this interview would receive a dead bird in the mail with a note saying, you're next, after it went public. SMU had denied paying David Stanley or anyone else, and all people had to go on was the word of Stanley, a known drug abuser. Then, Sparks pulled out the envelope. Two of them, actually, but one mattered a lot more. It was an envelope handwritten on SMU stationery. It had the initials of SMU's recruiting coordinator, who was sitting right there on the top corner. And the worst part was the date. October 4th, 1985. Just months after SMU had been put on probation and punished again for violating rules. The three reps sat there and took it, looking dumbfounded and guilty. The next couple months consisted of the downward spiral that destroys and ends every great crime ring. The full truths, houses and cars and salaries, adding up to the hundreds of thousands of dollars being given by SMU boosters would all come to light in due time. One last damning piece of evidence was added to the letter. Sparks had taken a sample of the SMU recruiting coordinator's known handwriting and compared it to the initials on the letter. An FBI handwriting expert then concluded that they were from the same person and was willing to testify that fact under oath. It was over. <laughs> they were done. And you want one more stupid, crazy thing to throw into this equation? Remember Bill Clements lost his bid for re-election as Texas governor a couple years ago? Came back to head the board? Well, at the end of 1986, because he didn't have enough on his plate, he decided to run for governor of Texas again. With enormous and never-ending brewing scandal from the university he was directly associated with, what do you think happened? It's Texas. Obviously, the f***ing re-elected him. Bill Clements, who had, in no uncertain terms, been commanding and running SMU's illicit ring of recruiting from the shadows, was back in the power position of Texas governor. A group of over 200 SMU professors signed a petition to ban all athletic scholarships from the school, calling the current arrangement quasi-professional and an entertainment industry. Not that inaccurate. The faculty, who had always silently stood by whatever decision the boosters made, finally turned on them. SMU's president, the one consistently pushed around and told to stay out of it, resigned 48 hours later. Finally, and not until now, the men in power decided to stop payments to players completely. December was the first month in years that no money was sent out to players at SMU. It was noted by the athletic department that at least 10 new players that month had applied for special student loans. As the NCAA investigated SMU football, the writing was on the wall. The whole slush fund had come to light. The university compiled with the rest of the investigation and were praised for it, which gave them some hope of leniency. The NCAA's investigation committee even recommended a slightly lighter punishment than the death penalty, but when it came time for punishment, nothing was held back. 
SMU fit every necessity for the repeat violator rule, and then some. They were more than deserving. The NCAA rep would say the program was so riddled with violations over such a long period of time that there didn't seem to be any other options. The hammer was dropped. Their entire 1987 season canceled. No scholarships, and they'd be limited for four more years on them. While it was officially only a one-year ban, they had a slashed schedule and were allowed no home games for the 1988 season, and the school would go on to cancel that one on their own. All players currently under scholarship were allowed to transfer to other schools, free of penalty, and most did. A new probation term would last through 1990. Two years of absolutely no football. They were officially dead. No matter how upset fans were at the NCAA or Bill Clements or their own administration or at every other school for not getting caught breaking similar rules, no matter how mad it made them, very few would argue that it was undeserved. In a state like Texas, where they'll proudly kill you for breaking their law, complaining about SMU being put down would be nothing short of hypocritical. Well, that's Dallas. Dallas and me. Bill Clement's entire second term as Texas governor was marred by his involvement in this scandal. A former White House official turned state governor attempting to orchestrate and cover up a pay-for-play scheme seems like a tale of fiction, honestly, and you can imagine how much political tabloids loved that. He would eventually end up admitting that he was aware and involved in the decision to continue payments even after SMU was put on probation. He faced a slew of calls for his impeachment, but was ultimately able to serve out his full second term. Ronald Reagan called Bill Clements his favorite governor in the country. Clements passed away in 2011. Sherwood Blunt would remain banned for life from involvement in SMU athletics. The rest of his career would become much more private, as he smartly stayed out of the spotlight, becoming a member of a few administrative boards and a big figure in the Boy Scouts of America Corporation, which morality level is iffy, but alright. Sherwood remains the only main figure from the scandal who refuses to speak on it. He did not give an interview for the book I read or any other ones, and he declined to be in the Pony Excess 30 for 30. I was unable to confirm if he's still living. David Stanley continued to struggle with various addictions, destroying his own body, until he passed away in his sleep at the age of 41. Sean Stopperich died of a cocaine overdose at the age of 29. Both men struggled to cope with their role in the scandal and never returned to SMU. Ron Meyer had a solid NFL tenure, coaching for the Patriots and Colts, as well as some other small professional leagues, before his career weeded out. He did win an impressive two AFC Coach of the Year awards, one on each team. Among casual football fans, he's easily best remembered for the snowplow game. Playing in thick snow in a 0-0 game late in the fourth quarter, Meyer made the controversial decision to have a snowplow operator clear a spot for the Patriots kicker on the field. The action was allowed, the field goal was made, and the Patriots won the game 3-0, despite outrage from many that the game was not played equally fair. But all Ron had done was proven for the umpteenth time in his career that he simply thought outside the box when it came to football. The mastermind behind the system that led to SMU's demise was never formally punished in any way. Ron Meyer passed away in 2017. SMU held no bad blood towards him. And what about SMU football? Well, it's not what it used to be. And it wasn't easy to get anywhere near close to there again. After returning from the two-year hiatus, they won a total of four games in three years, including a conference record of 0-24. Oh, 
1989, the first season back, they lost a football game against Houston, 95 to 21. Houston's 1,021 yards of total offense gained still stands today as an NCAA single game record. When the Southwest Conference collapsed not long after, instead of being put with powerhouses somewhere like the Big 12, SMU bounced around some small conferences. A lot of people blame the whole fall of the Southwest Conference on SMU and their collapse, which I don't necessarily agree with. I think they were on their way out. It was the dirtiest conference in college football, but it's fair to say SMU's downfall sped up the Southwest destruction. SMU fought as a mediocre Division I team for a long while, with small peaks of success that were awesome, but never touched the highs of the program's past. It was understandably tough to attract star talent. But finally, just last year, SMU finished the season ranked 22nd in the country, their first end-of-season ranking since the death penalty. And then in 2024, 37 years later, SMU made the jump into the Power Five, joining the ACC. It's an enormous opportunity for the program to keep inching closer to a full turnaround. Also, I just feel it should be said, as of the introduction of NIL money, everything has been flipped upside down from how it was during this case in the 80s. It's now a public battle for who can offer the most money instead of a private one. And I mean, because of that, I feel like we got to bring the SMU boosters back into play. Why not bring the whole Southwest Conference back and see what they can do? They were ahead of their time. Sherwood Blunt in this era would be Wilt Chamberlain numbers. These guys have more experience than anyone else does yet. And while I'm joking, we have actually seen this start to happen, as SMU was boosted hugely with some of the largest NIL numbers in the country, higher than what you'd expect from a team of their caliber. So the Texas oil men, they're waking back up. It's almost unanimously agreed that the NCAA did not intend for the death penalty to cripple SMU football quite as devastatingly as it did. Remember, they wanted to scare others out of cheating and rightfully punish a school who just kept on doing it. But the long-standing effects, completely innocent students being punished with a lack of quality football for decades to come, or thousands of alumni having the legacy and reputation of their alma mater be put in the dirt, entirely out of their control. The NCAA doesn't want to do that. We would go on to see the punishment applied to a pair of low division schools, but ever since SMU football got hit, no division one program in any sport has been handed a death penalty. And in my opinion, no one ever will again. No one wants to see a program fighting through its own ashes for four decades again, even if SMU deserved it, and they did everything they could do to deserve it. It affected far more beyond the guilty parties, which just isn't right. We've seen schools get close. The idea is brought up at least half seriously for basically any school in trouble, most recently with Michigan football, which, no, not even the same ballpark. Some schools have self-imposed team suspensions for a year or more, a sort of self-death penalty, including the Notre Dame men's swimming and diving team just this year, but... These weren't done with the purpose of avoiding the actual death penalty. It was just the best thing for these schools to do. It wasn't coming to any of these teams. Because, hey, if Penn State gets away without a death penalty, it better never be given out again. Thank you.